Good evening, all, and welcome. Tonight, I've got a collection of camping stories, and I'm really excited because I personally think they're excellent, and we're going to have a great night. So buckle up because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. The summer of 2008 was a rough time to graduate from college. I had spent four years getting a degree only to find the job market had all but dried up. As bummed out as I was about being unemployed for the foreseeable future, I found a deep appreciation for backcountry camping and hiking that summer. Growing up in the Rocky Mountains and graduating from a college in western Montana, I was not a stranger to hiking or camping, but that summer it became an escape to the point of an obsession. Going on daily hikes and camping beneath the stars really helped my mental health while I was worried about my life's purpose and my future. It was June, and unseasonably cold, wet and cloudy. The daytime heights barely touched 50 degrees, and at night it dropped below freezing. Despite the weather, I had planned to hike around the Anaconda Range that week, and I wasn't going to let it deter me. My plans for the week, funnily enough, were to hike from Storm Lake over Storm Lake Pass and down to Upper Seymour Lake. Storm Lake, actually an alpine reservoir, is a challenge to get to and requires a 4x4 pickup and some skilled driving. The road is a narrow two-track, winding its way through thick pine forests and was slick with rain. But I made it to the top with little heartburn. I set up camp on the north side of the lake and decided to do some fishing. The fishing was miserable. It was cold and nothing was biting. But the best thing about bad fishing is that my thoughts were free to wander while I sat on the shore. The rain was a constant light drizzle and created a natural white noise. Time passed and my daydreams were cut short as a low rumble up from the canyon overtook the sounds of the rain. The rumbling was not unlike that of a distant diesel engine. There were no roads that go beyond where I was camped. No machinery or vehicles could be up that canyon. Maybe it's a plane, I thought, looking up into the rain and clouds. But the sound wasn't getting any closer or further away, and the sound was not above me. It came from beyond the lake and up into the canyon. The sound was stationary and constant. This was most certainly not a plane or a truck or a bulldozer. All of this wasn't outright scary, but nonetheless, my hair stood on end while I sat there listening. After 20 minutes, the rumbling faded away, and I was left again with only the sound of raindrops. Soon enough, I caught a decent-sized trout, cleaned it, and headed back to the camp to get ready for dinner. The fish cooked up fine, but to be honest, I hate trouts. It's edible, but sure enough, totally unappetizing. They taste like mud. I ate as much as I could and tossed the rest back into the lake, building up my fire for the night. I sat back to enjoy the evening with a bit of whiskey. Night came fast. The mountain ridges put the sun to bed early and the rain clouds obscured the starlight. It was dark, really dark. The sound of a crackling warm fire and the rain bouncing off my tent were a great comfort to lull me to sleep. I reminded myself that I needed to build up the fire before bed. I walked over to my pile of scavenged firewood and grabbed an armful. Being away from the fire's crackling, I could pick up that all too familiar rumbling rising in the background. It was growing louder than before and closer. I may have had a few too many pours of whiskey and was tired and grouchy. The noise was ruining my whole camping trip and my buzz. Frustrated, I yelled into the darkness of night, Hey, shut up! Like a switch being flipped, the rumbling stopped, and so did the rain. My heart skipped a beat. I realized this was not a complete coincidence. Something intelligent was out there. Something sentient, observing me and responding to my screams. And I wasn't getting the most positive vibes from it. I threw all the logs on the fire and retreated back to my tent, more on edge than I have ever been, listening, listening to the fire crackling, to my rapid breathing, and beyond that to the silence of the darkness. 
Before this moment I had felt alone but safe. Now, I felt alone and vulnerable. Beyond where the light faded, I felt that there were a million eyes in the dark watching me. My paranoia began to subside when the rain suddenly started again. Not a drizzle, but a downpour. I was glad I had built up the fire, or it would have been snuffed out for sure. My tent was being pushed down by the force of the storm. I thought about bailing to the truck, but I knew I'd be soaked to the bone in an instant. Risking injury or death over getting wet is the kind of logic only whiskey can produce. I could feel the rainwater pooling and moving under my tent. The storm wasn't letting up. The urge to get in the pickup and drive away was ever more tantalizing. I could get my stuff tomorrow in the daylight and spend a few nights in town, but I'd had a bit too much to drink. Driving, especially on that slick, muddy, two-track road, would have been a death sentence. But I still needed a safer place to sleep than a wimpy tent. Grabbing what I could, I ripped open the tent flaps and ran for the truck. I was soaking wet by the time I settled into the driver's seat and locked the doors, turning the heat on full blast. I hoped that it would dry me out. It was going to be a miserable night, though. I reclined my chair and tried to calm my thoughts with deep breaths. The rain wasn't letting up. I was warm from the heater, and I was riding the crest of a good whiskey buzz. The fire was still raging despite the rain and kept the campsite well lit. I remember the truck's clock reading 1.06 a.m. I blinked. It was only a moment later, but when I opened my eyes, the rain had stopped. It was foggy and quiet. The once raging campfire was now embers, and there was morning twilight to the east. The truck's clock now read 5.45 a.m. It was morning. That couldn't be right. Almost five hours gone in the blink of an eye. I must have passed out. My head was killing me. I didn't feel like I had drunk that much to justify that kind of hangover. I turned off the truck and stepped out to survey the night's damage. My tent was completely flattened. The tent poles were shattered to pieces and everything was soaking wet. Smothering the remains of the fire, I dragged all the junk to the pickup and tossed it in the bed. My hike over the pass wasn't happening today. That was for sure. It was around 6.30 a.m. before I finished picking up camp. As I climbed into the cab of my truck, I heard the rumbling again through the morning fog. I drove out of there as fast as I could down that muddy bobsled track of a road, not once looking in the rearview mirror. I have never been back to Storm Lake, and I probably never will. When I was around 14, in 2003, I went on a camping trip with my mother and stepfather and four younger siblings. We were never a very well-off family. In fact, we were quite poor. I never went on holidays abroad, and we would always usually go camping to the same campsite which felt like miles away, but in reality was less than 10 miles from the city where we lived. We had been there a few times previously, I knew the campsite and surrounding area fairly well. It felt pretty safe and familiar. On this occasion, everything was going pretty normal, but I hated camping. My parents would always argue when it came to putting up the tent. It was pretty boring being in the woods, and I would normally be the one entertaining my siblings. I hated not having electricity, access to proper toilets or showers. It could be quite fun looking back, and I do have treasured memories I have with my stepdad who is no longer with us. Usually we would go on long hikes or bike rides, with my stepdad using maps to charter our way to a small village promising to get us all ice cream, which was a real treat, as we never usually had it. On this camping trip, we were going to go on a 10-mile bike ride. Both my parents had their own bikes along with my sister and I. My stepdad's bike had the small trailer where my three younger siblings, all under the age of five, sat. It was hard work going on these epic bike rides, but I rather enjoyed being in the middle of the woods surrounded by nature. We weren't in the middle of nowhere, but it was remote enough for it to be inaccessible to public transport. Only forest ranger type vehicles could access the roads. They weren't real paved roads with tarmac, more like dirt roads, which were only really suited for bicycles. During all the times we went camping, we never saw any other vehicles go down these roads. 
On this day, we were all cycling down this road when suddenly we heard the sounds of vehicles coming up slowly behind us. My stepdad in front of us, when he stops and tells us to move aside to let the vehicles come past. There's a sense of urgency and confusion in his tone as he's unsure why there's even a vehicle here. The vehicle passes us and we were expecting to see a forest ranger vehicle, you know, the 4x4 pickup or Land Rover kinds, but instead we see an estate slash station wagon kind of car with a long body and large trunk with a window in the back. In the back of this station wagon, I see several large trash bags and it's a very strange sight. I may only be a teenager, but this is a sight that sets off alarm bells for several reasons. One, this is not a car that is designed for going off-road in the woods. As previously mentioned, we have never encountered any vehicles down this bike road before. The person driving is clearly not lost as they didn't stop to ask for directions. There are big black trash bags in the back of the car that look very suspicious. What I mean by this point is they are full and tied up very tight. We could all see into the back of the car and I didn't see anything poking out of the bag to indicate it was full of garbage. The driver looked very rough and I don't mean to sound rude, but he looked mean. I can't recall his features, just that he did not look like a friendly person that belonged in the countryside. He wore dark clothing. I think he was clean shaven with short hair. I just wish I remember more of what the guy looked like. As if this incident couldn't get any stranger, what took place next has left such an impression on me that I still recall the sense of fear that I felt at the time as I share this. The car drives on several more feet. The driver stops. For what feels like the longest time in my entire life, nothing happens. We're all watching the car. My stepdad told us to remain still. He's very serious, assessing the situation. Then the car's reverse lights come on and the car starts reversing to us. My stepdad, who was in the army for several years, was one of the toughest guys I knew, goes into full-on panic mode and tells us to run. We don't even get on our bicycles to ride. Instead, we flee on foot, running with our bicycles through the woods until we find a railway bridge which we'd previously passed over. We never look back. I have no idea if the man got out of his car to look for us. I don't know if he just continued driving. I had no idea what was in those bags. We never really spoke about what happened that day. I know it was something that seriously scared my stepdad because of his response, and it left us frightened about who I might encounter in the woods to this very day. When I was around 12, my friend's dad, Carl, took us camping up in the Blue Mountains. My friend's aunt and uncle and some cousins would meet up there later with their fifth wheel. We got there and Carl started setting up the tent. The campsite was probably around 10 to 15 designated campsites with a small public bathroom, but we were the only people there. So while Carl was setting up the tent, my friend and I were farting around the big empty area, going down by the river and just being douchey 12 year olds. We were around 40 to 50 feet away from our tent when this old little red pickup pulled in with an older couple inside. The man looked sickly, long, greasy hair, older and sweating profusely. These people get out of their truck and start telling Carl to pack up the tent to get out of there because we were in their campsite, even though the whole place was empty. My friend and I stopped what we were doing and started to watch and listen to the conversation because the guy started getting really angry, raising his voice at Carl and getting in his face and cussing him out. Carl is trying to defuse the situation, but the older guy goes back to his truck and grabs something from under the seat. He starts walking towards Carl, and in his hands is a machete. He's acting like he's going to attack Carl. Carl yells at us to get into the truck now and he follows. We pull out of the campsite and call the ranger. The ranger came and all he did was send the couple to another campsite down the road. My friend and I were terrified all night the guy was going to come back for us, especially when it got dark and we were exploring around the woods, away from the adults and the campsite. My partner and I were on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, 
doing what most young couples do. Take a van, put a mattress in the back, and drive around the island camping in random woods. The weekend we chose was particularly busy, so every campsite was full. The thing with Vancouver Island is that it's a lot of logging roads with many pull-offs. We were travelling from one old growth forest to another when it was getting dark. We found a random turn-off that had an old gate ripped off, very common, and pulled into an area lakeside. As we pulled up, we noticed there was a fire with another couple, one other van, and a tent on the other side. We got out, chatted with a couple who were quite nice, and asked about the tent. Turns out it was empty when they got there the night before. Now, this wasn't some run-down tent. It was quite new, had a brand new paddleboard, books lying around the fireplace, a hammock strewn up, but whatever. We didn't give it a second thought. My partner and I went to bed early, got up and the van was gone, but the tent was still empty. We didn't think anything of it, so went into town, which was a little way off. We did some hikes, explored a bit, and decided to go back to our lakeside camping spot. When we returned, the tent was still there. At this point, we were wondering, it's been three days and no one, with all the gear lying around? My mind is now going into the worst scenario. Oh God, has someone perished in there? At this point, the sun is setting and we're both freaking ourselves out. My partner starts joking about vampires, but I decide to look in the tent. I very reluctantly open it and it's empty, but there is a note inside in French. Thankfully, my partner speaks French and translates it. It turns out two friends of this person had come to this spot expecting to meet some girl four days before we had gotten to this site, which means the tent had been there for at least four days. Now we're thinking, God, what if the person was kidnapped or killed and we're staying here? Or what if some murderer's on the loose? At this point, we didn't want to drive anywhere since it was starting to get dark, and everywhere else we saw was full. This is when all of a sudden, out of the bushes, comes a small shadow which scared the crap out of us. It's a pet rabbit. It hops over to us, and we notice there's rabbit food under a tarp near the tent. Probably 45 minutes later, another couple drove in with a van, and we chatted with them a bit, which helped us sleep through the night. But it definitely wasn't restful sleep. We ended up reporting the tent to the police, but as usually is the case, there was never any follow-up. I really do wonder what happened there. This was on a private island, while I was at a month-long summer camp. Our group went on an overnight camp out in the woods. So as we were walking through a particularly dense part of the woods, we found a dead fawn. We were all trying to walk around it, but it was right on the trail so it was hard to squeeze by. As I walked around the corpse, there was a hole about an inch across from the front left shoulder and blood had seeped out. We hiked on and slept the night. Then when we went back to camp on the same trail, the deer was gone, but the blood was still there. We finished our hike. And fast forward a few days, we were walking through the trail in the camp and found another dead deer. This one was fully grown. She had two holes in her, one on the flank and one on the front shoulder. This time I was positive those things were bullet holes. I had been out hunting deer with my grandparents and the holes looked exactly like that. That begs the question though, who was hunting for sport on a private island that's exclusively used to host and camp for kids? It's honestly disturbing to think what could have happened had something gone wrong or a child been mistaken or whatever. You know, you get some trigger happy people and it's just something that plays on my mind. The Okefenokee Swamp is located mostly in South Georgia and partially in North Florida. I'd been going there since I was a kid. My dad and uncle were avid outdoorsmen, and they were always canoeing, hiking, hunting, fishing, etc. And I grew up learning to love the same things. Now, the first thing that came to your mind when I said swamp was alligators. And you would be correct. And this swamp has some of the largest around. 
It may sound super scary to non-southerners, but the old saying really is true. If you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. Canoeing slowly down the dark, tea-colored waters, if you pass too close to one, it will quietly sink into the murky depths. He's not coming to get you. You've simply interrupted his sunbathing. As elementary school kids in South Georgia, it was a kind of rite of passage to go to the Okefenokee field trip and be led on a guided tour by Joe. He was a true outdoorsman, extremely knowledgeable, friendly, good with kids, a little strange, but generally regarded as a good guy, a local legend. He would get that boat closer to the big gators than my dad ever let me get. He taught us kids about them. We even got to hear the mating call of some of the males and watch a lot of their behavior up close. He would also show us all the birds, snakes, and other wildlife. The swamp's residents were used to Joe's boat, so they didn't flee when he got close. Great memories. Anyhow, fast forward to my adulthood, and I still have a great love for the outdoors. I'd recently gotten married and was successfully getting my wife and stepdaughter into kayaking, camping, and hiking. I'd broken them in fairly easy. Calm lakes and beautiful, crystal clear, blue spring-fed Florida waterways. We'd encountered some gators, but the girls had already become comfortable with the fact that they don't want to hurt humans. I decided it was time to go out to the Okefenokee and show them my childhood swamp stomping grounds. We headed out one weekend, kind of on a whim. I hadn't called ahead to reserve a campsite because I assumed that they wouldn't have been busy yet. Well, I was wrong. Every tent camping site was booked. I was pretty visibly bummed out, so I guess the ranger felt sorry for me. She told us to hold on, and was going to check one more thing. When she came back, she had some great news. There was a primitive group site available. If you aren't familiar, these are larger sites that are usually for bigger groups like Boy Scouts, usually situated a main from the main campground areas. They do not have electricity. We camp 100% primitive all the time, so this wasn't an issue for us. The ranger explained that this particular group site had been closed for two seasons due to the road being washed out. They said they had just fixed the road the week before, but hadn't gotten around to relisting the site as available. She offered it to sell it to us for a normal fee, instead of the group fee. Deal. We pay, and she vaguely showed us on the map how to get to our home for the night. I remember thinking, damn, that's far as hell from the other sites, but it's going to be nice and quiet. While at the office, we learnt that that evening there was going to be a ranger-guided night paddle. This particular park inside the Okefenoki is a designated dark sky park, meaning there's very little light pollution. I was already excited about showing my family the stars in Milky Way, so getting out onto the water at night and seeing the skies that way sounded sweet. We decided to sign up for the night paddle and then head off to find our campsites. When we got there, you could tell right away that the area hadn't been used in several years. Overgrown, spider webs everywhere, and teeming with the usual wildlife. I kind of prefer things this way, so I don't think twice about it. It was so far from the campgrounds and the main office area, you couldn't hear a single sound of human or vehicle. The area was large, so I walked around a bit to find a good spot to set up. I looked back at my map to try and gauge exactly how this little island was shaped, and noticed what I was seeing and what the map showed didn't quite line up. Whatever, I'm sure I was just reading it wrong. We set up our camp and just enjoyed the sunshine and the sound of nature. It was still very early spring, so the hordes of mosquitoes and various other swamp bugs weren't out yet in full force. The bugs in the swamp in the summer months could be a horror story of themselves, and around 7.30pm we loaded the kayaks back into my pickup and headed all the way across to the park to the launch area, as our guided paddle was supposed to start at 8. We approached the launch area with a good 15 to 20 people going into the paddle. Led by a young, enthusiastic ranger, we all slipped off into the water with our headlamps on the red light setting. We exit the small canal we had been traveling in and emerged out into a larger river-type waterway that meandered through the swamp. As we slowly and quietly crept along, 
cypress trees draped with Spanish moss loomed over us on both sides, with a dramatic orange and pink sunset as their backdrop. The sun finally began disappearing, and the stars started to come out. It was absolutely stunning, and still one of my favourite kayaking memories. I'd never actually seen the Milky Way like that before. It was a new moon night, dark as it could be. About a mile from our original launch, we all congregated out in the middle of the wide waterway and sat completely still and quiet. The motionless dark waters of the swamp reflected the skies like a mirror. Thousands of stars and galaxies twinkled above us, and below us it was like being in space. Shooting stars were visible every few minutes. It was really magical. The only artificial light in the sky was the dull glow of Jacksonville, Florida on the horizon, which was about a hundred miles to our southeast. After a while, the ranger snapped all of us out of our trance. It was time to head back. When we were paddling out there, it had been dusk slash twilight for most of the trip. Not much light, but enough to kind of silhouette the trees and branches against the sky, and a slight glimmer on the water. By now it was pitch black, and I do mean pitch black. The ranger told us to switch our headlamps back onto their normal white light setting, so that we could all see well enough to navigate out of the swamp. As each headlamp slowly switched on and the swamp was illuminated, we were met with hundreds of glowing eyes. Hundreds, I swear to you. Now, as I said earlier, I grew up out here. Gators were nothing new nor scary to me at all. However, growing up, we really never stayed out of the water past dark. We would shine our lights out over the water to look at all the eyes, but from dry land far away from the beasts. Now I found myself and my little family quite literally pushing past floating gators with our kayaks. They were absolutely everywhere, all over the sides, all of the channel, as well as blocking our way to the center. The ranger was leading and assured everyone not to worry. He paddled up towards a huge group of shining eyes ahead of us and pushed right through them. Most of the eyes disappeared under the water, but the gator directly in the ranger's path thrashed and his tail hit the kayak. Holy crap. Sharp gasps from the group pierced the otherwise quiet southern night air, but the ranger showed no sign of panic, which was reassuring. We all trusted the young man that we weren't going to really piss them off by kayaking straight into them. As we went along, the sounds of the gators being bumped by kayaks and thrashing were heard every few minutes. There weren't any other jarring sounds or movements, just the constant calling of frogs, cicadas, and the splashing of disturbed dinosaurs. When we finally turned back into the small channel that led to the launch, there were no more glowing eyes. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a bit freaked out, but I can honestly say I wasn't panicking. The ranger being so cool and confident while leading the way made it pretty easy to stay calm. Everyone started to relax again as we neared the launch and got out, loaded our boats, and one by one headed back to our camps. There was a line of red trail lights following off towards the main campground, while my wife, daughter, and myself split off alone into the darkness towards the other side of the park where our site was. I do remember that feeling, kind of eerie, but everyone had made it through the gator gauntlet safely with no problems. Now we were laughing about it and remarking on how cool the whole experience was. We were in high spirits, no stress. We had no idea that the terror would come much later in the night. We got back to our site around midnight and we were starving. I got a nice fire going while my wife prepped dinner. The meal finished cooking around 1 a.m and we finally all settled down to get comfy by the fire and eat. But I hadn't taken two bites of my food when the horrifying experience began. The cicadas and frogs were singing, but you tend to drown that out in the background because it's so constant. But suddenly, out of the calming buzz of their singing, sprung a sound that I will never forget. A low, rumbling, guttural growl, long and deep vibrating in our chests. We all froze and looked at each other. Did you hear that? Not ten seconds later, we heard it again. 
Yes, we definitely heard it. It sounded close, really close, like on the other side of the bush. The only thing I could honestly relate it to at the time was the growling that a T-Rex makes in Jurassic Park. I was terrified. I've been scared in the woods and the swamps. I've seen swamp gas, freaky creatures heard screams. I've been in the Marine Corps. I've encountered bears in the Appalachian Mountains. I've explored and experienced all kinds of places. When I tell you I have never been this scared, I mean it. Pure, raw, primordial fear. I immediately told the girls to get into the cab of my pickup. They get into the truck, and I hop into the bed of the truck with my little .375 Magnum drawn. I figured being back there would get me up off the ground and give me a little advantage over what was coming. I told the girls to lock the doors and open the little sliding back window so that we could communicate. I frantically started shining my flashlight around, aiming my gun along with it. I see absolutely nothing. We continue to hear the growling coming from one general direction, not getting any softer nor louder, just continuously emitting in three to five second long intervals every 30 seconds or so. It was coming from the brush right next to our site. I shine my light all over that area but see nothing, just thick palmetto leaves, underbrush and pine, no movement whatsoever. Then, suddenly, we heard the sound coming from the complete opposite direction, more towards the open area of our sight. I whip around and shine my light that way, and that's when I noticed the dense fog that had settled onto the entire area. It was a damp, sticky, suffocating fog. Almost right away, the growling sound was coming back from the original direction. I whip around, but immediately I hear it again behind me. That's when I realized there were two of them, doing a kind of call and answer to each other. That's also when I realized the other sounds of the swamp had gone silent, nothing but the call and answer of whatever was making these absolutely gut-wrenching sounds. It got deafeningly quiet for a moment, nothing but the heavy fog which seemed to have a silent sound of its own. My wife, with shaky, trembling voice, told me she wanted to leave immediately and that our daughter agreed. Now I was absolutely terrified. Do not misunderstand this. However, the thought of just leaving all of my expensive camping gear behind me was somehow more offensive, not to mention I was getting kind of frustrated. I'm home in this damn swamp. I know all the creatures here. I'm comfortable here. It's borderline pissing me off that something out there has me so scared and confused. I start trying to rationalize what could be making this sound. Suddenly, it started back up again, but now it sounds like there could be four or five of them, all growling back and forth to each other, overlapping each other, now coming from all sides. A demonic chorus of deep, rattling, soul-sucking rumbles, not getting any closer or further away, just keeping us closely surrounded. If I'd have needed to defecate, believe me, I would have crapped myself. I kept myself at least somewhat cool by affirming that it must be animals of some kind. I wouldn't even entertain the thought of anything supernatural or cryptic. My wife kept saying it sounded like a big cat, and while I agreed I knew it just wasn't, it would have had to have been a massive lion or tiger to make some extremely low rumbling. I racked my brains for the biggest animal it could be and kept landing on alligator. Yet we had just paddled directly through an entire swarm of them, some of them absolutely massive and they hadn't made a single sound the whole time we were out on the water. No, that couldn't be it. I even had a thought that the young, playful ranger had orchestrated some kind of practical joke on us poor campers out here all alone. Really and truly, I had no idea what it was, and not being able to even see a glimpse so I could take a shot at it to protect my family was a very helpless feeling. I really wish I had more words for how it felt, just blindly standing in the back of that truck, hearing what I could only imagine were the scariest, evilest, most vile things on the planet, just knowing that they wanted to kill, eat, or otherwise mutilate myself and my family. It felt like an eternity, but we'd probably only been holed up in the truck for 10 to 15 minutes at this point. It had finally gone quiet again, and I told the girls that we could leave, but I'm not leaving the gear. I climbed into the cab 
and started the truck and moved it, positioned it to where I could shine the headlights on our stuff and packed it all up, gun in hand. I began rolling up the tent, gathering all of our stuff and throwing it into the bed of the truck, praying nothing crazy happened, like my truck dying, or some other perfectly timed cinematic horror moment. I tried to put on a confident air as to not scare my family, but in my head I felt so vulnerable like I was something's prey. The growling still hadn't returned, but honestly the silence was freaking me out more than anything, and the fog. I'll never forget how oppressive that fog felt. All of our gear was sopping wet with it, and I swear it was just hard to breathe the air. The fire was nothing but a smolder, despite the fact it had been roaring bright twenty minutes ago. Just as I was rolling up the very last sleeping mat, one, final, closer than before growl, shook me to my core. I snatched that mat up and took off running, getting to the truck, Duke of Hazard style, and taking the hell off. None of us looked back. When we finally got back home, I had a browse on YouTube, and I heard something that made my skin crawl. It was the sound that large male alligators made while mating. The louder, slower, and scarier sounding, the more the female gator finds it attractive. Those must have been the swamp's sexiest alligators, because I had never heard this sound in all my life. I had been under the impression that I knew what their mating call sounded like from my childhood experiences in the Okefenokee Joe's boat and my father and uncle. These gators must have been absolutely massive to produce the sounds we were hearing, because it was nothing like what you ever heard in the swamp. It was like what I saw in that video. But I'm telling you, in person, you can physically feel it rattling your insides. Though, I was somewhat comforted by the fact that the noises were just gators flirting, and they weren't being aggressive towards us, my wife and daughter still think we were in danger, because we were close. I'm not too sure about that part. I got into Google Maps and tried to figure out exactly where we'd been camping, because from looking at the map the ranger had given us, we shouldn't have been that close to the water. I never could quite figure it out where we ended up. I don't know if it was us being in the wrong place, or the fact the area hadn't had any human activity for two years, or a combination of both that put us so close to all of this mating activity that would normally not happen in areas with lots of humans. Either way, it made for a heart-pounding experience that we still talk about to this day. Also, as a funny addition to the story, looking back, the most hilarious thing was that my daughter was eating corn on the cob at the time when we heard the first sound and it was still in her hands. So during the entire event of being terrified and hearing these growls, she had a corn on the cob in her hand. I can assure you though, that the fear and adrenaline in the moment were very real. Imagine hearing that sound in the pitch darkness of the night in the Okefenokee swamp and not knowing what it was. Looking back I suppose the fog settling in on us at the exact moment the growling started was just kind of a coincidence, but it did make the whole experience much scarier. I will never forget that particular kind of fear that I experienced that night. This event occurred in early fall 1971. I grew up in the Philly suburbs. The Boy Scouts were popular then, and I was quite active, especially with camping. One of the go-to areas was the New Jersey Pine Barrens, especially along the Wading River and Bass River State Forest. On to the man. Our patrol was on a weekend camping trip at the South Shore Campground. Lots of pine breaks, but even more swamps and bogs, and boggy swamps. Our patrol, probably seven of us plus one guy's dad who drove us, was assigned a three-sided shelter. The front of the shelter opened to the swamp. If you walked 11 feet from the front, you'd be standing in ankle-deep water, and then it just got deeper and darker and boggier. We mucked around Saturday until late afternoon, made our way back to the shelter, cooked dinner and chilled until it got dark. And it was crazy dark. No other campers around, and just the light of our slowly dying fire illuminated our space. We began to hear a slow splashing sound coming from the swamp, maybe a hundred feet from our fire. One of the guys yelled something towards the sound and everything went quiet. A minute later the splashing began again, but slower and more methodical. 
By this time it was within 15 feet of the fire, but it was out of the fire's light. Here's what our vibe was. None of us were concerned. We were all seasoned campers and figured it was a deer or raccoon looking to score an easy meal. Suddenly the walking became a slow, steady sloshing. This perked us up, wondering if this thing may suddenly decide to rush us. Our patrol leader jumped up, grabbed his flashlight and pointed it towards the noise. His light hit something and he yelled out, It's a man! and ran to the swamp berm. I saw a brief flash of red flannel in the flashlight beam and then heard a fast splashing back into the swamp. The splashing eventually faded out into the darkness. So what did we do? Try to figure out what the hell just happened? Then crawled into our sleeping bags and fell asleep? Well, nothing else happened, and we went home the next day as scheduled. Thinking back on this now, it must have been a local piney who knew the area well. The man had to navigate through some serious and dangerous swamps to check us out. The pines have a great and eerie vibes, and that weekend held both for us. I was in Wisconsin in the summer of 2017, with my buddies on a week-long camping trip for Boy Scouts. It was a pretty moderate weather, as it usually is up there in the summer, so we slept in our hammocks, in a group of trees next to each other away from the rest of our troop. The third night into the trip, we woke up at around one in the morning at the exact same time. One of my friends just said, screw it, let's go for a hike, and we all agreed. We didn't know the area, but we made sure we knew our way back. We were about 20 minutes in when we approached a clearing, and right as we did, everything went silent. Wisconsin has so many insects in the summer, and they are very loud. And then suddenly, there was nothing. The crunching of leaves under our feet was also gone. Then the shadows in the clearing started to look like they were growing and coming towards us and I felt as if we were in danger. We're all track guys, so we absolutely book it back in about four minutes. None of us slept that night, and we all came to the consensus that we all saw shadows coming towards us, had all the sounds go out, and felt danger coming. We still speak about that night sometimes when we get high, and it sends shivers down my spine. I'm very educated in my religion, and still cannot correlate that to my religion but I'm currently going over it with a scholar I respect. It scared me so much it was actually scarier than when I found a whole abandoned meth lab in Missouri, complete with hacksaws hanging from a tree. My boyfriend and I were camping alone in the mountains of Colorado in early June. There was still snow covering the top of the mountain, where we were, and there was little to no nature around. I woke up in the middle of the night to something lifting me and the corner of the tent. Freaked out, I quickly awoke my boyfriend with this strong urge to get out and shoot whatever was lifting the tent. He refused to let me do so. He yelled at it and it stopped, but later that night it happened again. But we slept through it. When morning came, we saw there were no handprints in the snow or any trace of an animal. I'd love your thoughts on what the hell could have been lifting my tent without leaving any prints. I'm a 24 year old male and have been backpacking my whole life and am very comfortable in secluded places. About a year ago, I went on a two night trip with some friends in Southwest US. We arrived at a trailhead late afternoon and decided to camp about a quarter of a mile up the trail at a small area with around three tents. Next to our site was a barren stream with a small hill at the top, and you could see the silhouettes of a little cottage. After setting up and eating dinner, we cracked a few cold ones and sat around the fire as per usual. A little time passed, and we hear some activity coming from where the cabin is. At first it was just the chatter of voices, but it soon changed to some sort of group laughter, almost as a chant. It was a very forced laugh with several people in unison, which lasted maybe five to 10 seconds. Pause, and again. At first, we assumed someone cracked a good joke at the cabin, but after about 30 minutes or so, it became very weird. At this point, it's quite late, probably around 11 p.m., and we decided we had to find out what was going on. We crept across the Barham River 
and up the hill almost to the crest, where we peered over. We were able to make out about 20 people sitting in a circle, laughing in rhythm with one another. I want to make it clear it was a very creepy laugh, not a natural type, more of a ho ho ho. Anyway, we head back to our site and write it off as some weird stuff, probably nothing to be worried about. Before sleeping, we went down to where we parked and sparked up a joint. Out of the woods come two guys, seemingly from the direction the cabin was in. One of them goes, Hey, were you guys at the cabin up there? And the individuals respond with, Yup. My friend continues, What are you guys doing up there? It was a Native American celebration of the full moon. It's not a full moon. Finally, my friend asks, How do you get involved with that? You sign up online. It costs $50 and includes dinner. The two individuals drove off as we returned to our campsite laughing about the whole situation. All in all, it was definitely a bit strange, but I'm glad it was nothing serious or sinister. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening all the way till the end. Well done. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. If you did, I'm pretty sure you know what to do by now. There are more stories that you can listen to on screen now if you are so inclined. And a huge thanks as always to my members and my patrons with their financial contributions to make this possible. And if you'd like to contribute, just follow the links to find out how and what rewards you get for doing so. But until next time, stay awesome and I'll see you in the next one.